Hearing it all. Okay, so today being the last unit um, lecture, we're going to look at two separate things in relationship to gases. The first is kinetic energy and how it relates to their effusion. What's gas effusion? Or it's kind of the same as diffusion, just has a little bit of a different meaning, but for the most part, what is diffusion? Spreading, okay. So gases will spread from high concentration to low concentration, and that's the way they travel. Effusion just means traveling through a small opening. It's still the same concept. Diffusion kind of implies whew, wide open spaces for molecules to go. Um, we're going to then look at the real gas law, which you guys kind of had to answer some pre-lab questions to on that molar mass lab. Remember the Van der Waals equation? So I'm actually going to show you the parts of that. So your AP um, homework, that UT homework, will be a lot easier after today. Um, first thing I want to show you is the equation for kinetic energy. You don't need to memorize this. The AP has gotten rid of all this memorization. I do need you to know, though, that kinetic energy of gases is dependent only on temperature, period. So if I have 5 million gases and all of them at the same temperature, they all have the same average kinetic energy. You probably will, in physics, have to learn 3 halves RT. If you do, it won't help you to memorize it, but the important thing, again, is the relationship of kinetic energy to temperature. In physics, you might have learned what kinetic energy is for, of an object, and that's one-half mv squared, right? Does that sound familiar? Well, that's of one bitty baby molecule. We look at average kinetic energy per mole, and that's going to be the difference. We're not going to worry about an individual molecule's kinetic energy, okay? Um, so what we also need to look at is the rate of diffusion or velocity that a molecule travels. I'm going to rewrite this equation because it looks scary. Velocity, termed root mean squared velocity, don't let that just scare you, it's still just velocity of, mole of gas molecules, is equal to 3RT over molar mass. If you want to calculate the velocity, you would just solve for that variable. What are the units of velocity in physics that you know? or just units of velocity, meters per second. So where that comes from is the use of this root mean squared velocity equation and a new R. And I failed to mention it here, but this R and this R, because we're dealing with energy and motion, here it's energy, there we're dealing about velocity, the R is called the, I call it the energy R. The energy R is 8. 8.14 joules per mole Kelvin. I know it seems like it's a totally different number than the other R. What was the other R? 0 0.0821 Latimolk. But you're going to learn in the next unit when we get to thermo, there's a relationship between joules and liter atmospheres. There's a conversion. And I'm going to teach you that conversion when we get there. But these are actually the same number. So the question you have to ask yourself is, which R do I use? If you're looking at anything in relationship to energy or to movement of those gas molecules, you need the energy R. If it's anything with conditions, pressures, moles, all that kind of stuff, we're going to use the Latimolk. Okay? Um, so where do the units of meters per second come from? Don't have to know where this comes from. I'm just showing you because there is some interest usually. And that is through the, you need to know what a joule is. I kind of wrote it on the side of the board over there for you to see. But we know that a joule in physics is a newton meter, correct? If you haven't gotten there yet, I don't know where you are in your curriculum, we know that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So a newton meter, or a joule, is a kilogram meter squared second squared. So if you plug that R into there, your molar mass is going to cancel, and this is something that you're going to need to pay attention to. When you put your molar mass in of your gas and you want to know its velocity, what do you have to put it in? Kilograms, exactly. So if we're doing oxygen, you have to put in 0.032 and not, point, and not 32. Okay? That's because of the unit of the joule. But notice the temperature is in joules per mole K. That's going to cancel. And the only thing we end up having left under the square root sign 
is meter squared over second squared. What's the square root of meter squared over second squared? Meters per second, and that's where we get that from. If I want you to do any of this, I'm going to provide it for you. I don't want you to freak out. What I do need you to know, though, is the relationship between molar mass and velocity. Have you all seen Austin Powers? Okay. I don't know if you remember the scene of Fat Bastard and Mini-Me running through the lab, and Fat Bastard's chasing him, get in my belly, and he's like, all, oh. And Mini-Me's like, zip, 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 and they kind of sped it up, and Fat Bastard's really slow behind him. So I think of gases diffusing. When I think of gases diffusing, I think of that. The bigger the gas, what can you tell me about the rate of diffusion? The slower the rate of diffusion. And this root mean squared velocity example actually kind of shows that mathematically. The smaller the molecule, what does that mathematically do to the velocity? Increases it. So if you like equations and you like memorizing them, you can use the equations as proof to certain statements. Or you can just say molar mass is indirectly proportional to the velocity. Okay? So the two things you have to know by heart. Kinetic energy of molecules depends on temperature. Root mean squared velocity, the smaller the molecule, the faster the diffusion, or the faster the velocity, or the faster the rate. That's all you have to know. So let's do some math, a little bit of math to practice, and then we'll do the theoretical AP kind of questions. So it says calculate the average velocity of a sample of helium atoms. Root mean squared is not the velocity of just one, it's the velocity per mole, so that's going to be our average velocity, is equal to... I will give this to you on the board at all times over molar mass. So if we're solving for root mean squared velocity, three, what R am I going to use? 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. The temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. 298K, got to convert it to Kelvin because of this guy. And then our molar mass. Remember, the joule is a kilogram-based unit, so we have to be in kilograms. So what is our kilogramage here? 0 0.004 helium, right? It's four kilograms per mole. So the kilograms is going to cancel out up here, somewhere up here. The moles is going to cancel, leaving us with meter squared over second squared. We take the square root of that. We get a velocity. Just give me 266 since that, uh, I think it's 1,400. Is that what y'all got? Meters per second. Again, I'm going to keep saying it over and over. I'm going to give you equations for this kind of thing if I want you to do it. But as far as memorization, you just need to know the smaller the molecule, the faster the rate. Okay. Another little law, and I'm going to go back a slide so you can look at it, that I didn't really show you, was something called Graham's Law. We covered this in pre-AP Chem, so I know majority of you had this. But it was a comparison of two velocities. This equation says the rate of one gas divided by the rate of the other gas is equal to the inversion of their molar masses. Where did it come from? All they did, and I could sit here and derive it for you, is just took one root mean, you see how that's the root mean squared velocity? They took root mean squared velocity of one gas, divided it by another gas to get the ratio of the rates, and they just simplified it. And the way you simplified it, you ended up with the rates being equal to that. So it's just a double simplification of root mean squared velocity. Graham's law compares two different gases. So if we were to use Graham's law, I would show it to you. You would not have to memorize it. You can answer this question. Oxygen diffuses at a rate which is 2.23 times faster than a sample of a reddish-brown gas. There's only one thing I expect you to know at this point about that reddish-brown gas. What was the only thing I'd want you to know right now? It's bigger than oxygen. Why is that? Because it's slower than oxygen. Oxygen is 2.23 times faster. Now, actually calculating the molar mass, because they're asking for a rate comparison, or they're giving you a rate comparison, you do the rate of one over the rate of other is equal to the inverse of the square, of the square root of the molar masses. So it would be two over one. So if I were to plug this in, 
I always like to just make it a practice to put the unknown molar mass on top because my math makes my math easier. Um, so down, this would be my unknown. What would be my oxygen's molar mass? 32. So oxygen would then have to go up top. I don't know the actual rates, but I know a ratio of rates, correct? So I put oxygen up here and I put the unknown down there. What would my ratio of rates be? Two, perfect. 2.23 to 1. So square both sides and multiply. Yes? Good question. Do you have to have it in kilograms? Technically, you should, but due to the fact that this is a ratio, they cancel out. So you end up getting gram, gram per mole canceling versus kilogram, kilogram canceling. Okay? All right. And this is the only scenario you can ignore the kilograms is when you're in Graham's Law. So what do you all get? It's got to be bigger than 32. 159 grams per mole. If you want to be safe and don't ever, ever mess up and decide you want to report it as kilograms per mole because you put the oxygen in as kilograms, that's fine. Just know if you put the oxygen in as kilograms, you're going to get out kilograms. So is everyone good with the two things I want you to know about kinetic energy and diffusion? This next question is exactly how you'll be asked on the AP, right here. In which flask will the molecules have the greatest kinetic energy? And I want you to tell me why. Here they didn't ask you why. If they don't ask you why, don't say it. Don't say more than you have to, because if you say something wrong, even though they didn't ask you, they're going to take off points. Okay? In which flask will the molecules have the greatest root mean squared velocity? And why? So look at your flasks. Part A, we're looking at kinetic energy. Why are they all the same? Okay, and I don't want you just to say temperature's the same. What would be a better answer? Same because, yes, kinetic energy depends only on temperature. And then you can say temps are the same. I need you to recognize or indicate that that's the reason you're choosing temperature, because you're aware of that relationship. If you like formulas, and if physics has already pounded 3 has RT into your brain, you can write that. Again, I'm not providing it for you unless I'm having you do math with it. It's one that you don't have to memorize. But you can just write this, point to that, and say temperature same, and you, you're done. Because that is the why. So whichever way you want to do it is going to be acceptable. I don't care. All right, that's A. What about part B? Which flask is going to have the greatest root mean squared velocity? RMS. Hydrogen. There is no, oh, there is hydrogen. I thought it was helium. Hydrogen, why? Okay, so what are you going to say? It's the smallest one. So, so smaller molar mass gases have what? have higher velocities. And again, if you wanted to know 3RT over molar mass, square root of all that, and write that down, you can use that as an indicator. Okay? Be careful. I've had students fall into this trap before and say, oh, this is mass. So bigger mass means more kinetic energy, means higher velocity. Ah, no. Again, that is per molecule, not a bunch of things in a container, a whole mole of things. Okay, we're looking at average kinetic energy and average velocity. Okay? You all ready for real gases? This is where teachers have lied to you. Yeah, we've lied. We always lie. You haven't figured that out yet? All right, PV equals NRT. What was that actually called? No, it's not actually called PIVNER. Thank you, Dwight. Dwight, the ideal gas law. <laughs> Dwight is the ideal student. Just like there is no ideal gas, there is no ideal student. Ooh. <laughs> so we kind of take some liberties when we use the ideal gas law, saying, oh, all gases are ideal. 
but they're really not. So the real gas law, or the van der Waals equation, takes, this is actually pervnert with some little correction factors in here. Your only job is to be able to tell me what makes gases not ideal and how this van der Waals equation corrects for that. I'm not going to have you memorize this crazy thing. You're always going to have it at your disposal if you need it. Okay? But we do need to address what makes gases ideal. So we already talked about earlier that gases are most ideal at high temperatures and low pressures. Tell me about the condition of the gas at that point. When you have a high temperature and low pressure, what, what does the gas look like? What do the molecules look like? They're very, very spread out. Good. Really, really spread out, moving really quickly. So if we take that and we go back to the kinetic molecular theory, there were two parts of it that were addressed in there. The first is ideal gases, they're so far apart, and they're really, 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 really tiny point volumes in space. So it's kind of like those molecules, because they're so tiny, they have no volume, right? But what's the truth about molecules, gas molecules? They really do take up volume, don't they? Okay, so we first have to correct for the fact that real, real gases actually have molecules that take up volume. All right, so if I have a container and then I have really big fat molecules in there that are making the volume bigger because they're so big, these molecules, I need to counteract that and make it more ideal. So what am I, how am I going to correct it mathematically? Am I going to add to that number or subtract? I'm going to subtract, and that's what's going on here. Here, we're subtracting a correction factor to address extra volume of large molecules, meaning non-ideal molecules. So the bigger the molecule, the bigger or smaller the correction factor. The bigger. The, more, the, bigger, the, vol the bigger the molecule, the more we subtract. OK? That makes sense. Yeah? All right. Am I ever going to have you do that? No. Because this is going to lead for you solving for moles, and it's going to be a cubic thing. And cubic functions, most of you don't know how to solve without graphing, and it's a mess. So you just need to understand that this correction factor is subtracted because ideal molecules are supposed to have no volume in, in space, so it won't affect the volume of a container. All right. The next one is the one that kind of gets people crazy. Um, the other part of the kinetic molecular theory said that these molecules, because they're so far apart, they're not supposed to have any attractive forces to each other. They're supposed to be totally oblivious and not be attracted to anything around them. How does an attractive force affect pressure? Any ideas? If, if all of a sudden the molecules are attracted to each other, what does it do to pressure? They would what? They would slam into each other more? Mm. What would they do? Think about it. What if you guys were running around the room and going crazy and bouncing off the walls, bouncing off each other, and all of a sudden you're really attracted to each other? What? What would happen? You stop. The, the attract, but what would that do to the pressure overall? It would decrease the pressure of the system, exactly. If the molecules start to become more attracted to each other, the whole collision idea would slow down, and then that would decrease the pressure. So since molecules actually are attracted to each other, our pressures are falsely a little low, right? So what do we have to do to correct for that? We're adding the correction factor here to increase the pressure. So in this case, we add a correction factor factor to, well, to increase pressure that was lowered by intermolecular attraction. That was lowered by what I call IMFs. In molecular forces, IMFs is an acceptable term to use on the AP if you don't want to write it all out. All right, so 
how are you going to know whether something's attracted to something or not? It is based on size, not directly on size. It is based on number of electrons. So let me talk about this. Let's say we have helium. How many electrons does helium have? Electrons on um, two, right? Two electrons. Okay, really tiny. Those electrons are kind of just doing their thing in the s orbital, hanging out. But if I had xenon, how many electrons does xenon have? How many? 54. I'm not going to do 54 dots. But the more electrons you have, I use the term squishy, the more squishy my orbital cloud is. For instance, if this xenon were floating around and it ran into a wall, what do you think happens to all those electrons? Remember, there's no shell. There's no hard thing around this protecting the electrons. You said, what, what? <laughs> no, they don't go boing. The, that's close. It's not really wrong. They do do something, but what do you think? I'm looking for a word. What are they going to do when you slam into this wall? Bam. The electrons are going to... Huh? Not repel. They're just going to... Remember, this is a squishy thing here. They're going to... Yes. They're going to go to the other side. They're going to shift. So a cloud that might look something like this, when we first are floating, free floating, when it hits another wall or hits, hits a wall or another particle, might end up looking more like that. If we have a molecule that looks like this, this has now become polarized. Have you heard of a polarizing personality? A not so good per a personality that makes you go ah like this, which some of you have. No, I'm kidding. Um, this becomes polarized. The more electrons, the more polarizable the orbitals. What does that mean? Well, now all the electrons are on the right side, correct? So now this kind of has a partial negative and a partial positive side, as opposed to here where it was pretty symmetrical. So for a short moment in time. This thing is going to be now attracted to other polarized shells. The ability to be polarized is dependent on how many electrons you have. Can helium get that same kind of polarization going on with just two electrons? No. So the more electrons, the more polarizable, more electrons, more polarizable, what does that do to intermolecular forces? More intermolecular forces, more attractive forces. So the more attractive, more, more electrons something has, the less ideal of a gas it's going to be because it's going to be attracted to the molecules around it. By sheer, we call this, and I don't want to overwhelm you with words right now, but this is called an induced dipole. Here's the dipole and it's induced based on something that came from the outside. It didn't naturally happen like that. Okay? It is partially, it's not like, it is. It is partially negative and partially positive, correct. Correct, Spider-Man. All right. So the way this would be asked in a question would be something like this. Explain in terms of the Van der Waals equation why HCl, hydrochloric acid in gaseous form, remember this is all gas, this unit is all on gas, is much less ideal than hydrogen gas. So what I want you to do when you have a problem about Van der Waals equation, you're going to have it either on the board or on your paper, you're going to go ahead and address the volume and then the pressure. And I want you to address both things if both things are, are an issue. So hydro hydrogen chloride, how does how is the volume affected? Because hydrogen chloride is what? Well, now we're looking at starts with a V. Volume come because is larger in volume. Uh, 
a correction factor must be subtracted to account for extra volume. So that's volume. Now, how does this affect pressure? Because HCl has more what? Good. Because it has more electrons, it is what? It is more, I want the fancy word, polarizable, polarizable, and there are stronger IMFs. So a correction factor must be what? Must be added to increase the pressure of the, I'm going to say, unusually attracted molecules. If you want to be safe, I probably should have um, written another statement here. Um, stronger IMFs, therefore, less pressure or a decrease in pressure, something like that. You do not need to write complete sentences. Bulleted statements are the shizzle. So if you just want to say boom, 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 boom in statements, you can. This is not in bio. I don't know if they still require full sentences. I'm thinking they might. I'll have to ask Mr. Martin about that. But in chem, we want diagrams. We want bulleted statements. We don't like to read. All right, so that's the non-ideal or Van der Waals or real gas law. Group quiz tomorrow.